Revelation chapter 13. We're, we're gonna, a lot of tonight is going to be about the beast and the false prophet. And this, this war really against uh, this, this good against evil that's happening in Revelation. We know this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm going to keep reminding you of that. So we know who wins because this is his story. And uh, we, we, we know who wins in the end. But tonight we're going to focus a lot on, on the beast and the false prophet and their role in these times. Because now we start to see we're in the middle of this tribulation and we're still discussing what's happening right now. In the middle of the tribulation, last week we began to talk a little bit about the 144,000 witnesses and their role and, and how God has sealed them. And so tonight we're going to look a little bit more into the beast and the false prophet. So I'm going to go right into that. Revelation chapter 13. We're going to read the first three verses. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Many scholars believe that the sea that you see there in verse 1 represents the masses of people, and he comes out of the masses of people. He, he's, and, and Scripture leads us to believe that he's going to come from obscurity. And there, there are scriptures that that tell us that he's going to come from, it seems, nowhere. Now, I don't believe that's going to happen in the middle of the tribulation. I believe he's going to be a leader from the beginning. But but John is going back, or John is seeing this, and, and Jesus is revealing this to him in this vision, and he's showing him how this beast comes about. And he's given a lot of symbolism here as he talks about the leopard and the bear and the lion and and there's a lot of different people that say a lot of different things about what these things can mean. It's honestly up to what you think they mean. Um, <clears throat> but I think the consensus by most theologians is that the leopard would represent Greece, the bear would represent Medo-Persia, Met and the lion would represent Babylon. Now, to a lot of us who aren't historians, that really doesn't mean a whole lot to us. But we see in, in Daniel chapter 7, I'm not going to go there and read that, but you can read that sometime. But in Daniel 7, he refers to this uh, beast as well and gives us some of this image, imagery as well. And when he talks about the lion, and the lion represents Babylon, their symbol was a winged lion. And so it makes sense that Babylon would be the lion. The bear, Medo-Persia. In Daniel, the bear was devouring um, with, with three ribs in its mouth. The three ribs would represent Egypt, um, <clears throat> the region of Turkey, or Egypt, Lydia, which is the region of Turkey and Babel, and, and then it would represent Babylon, Iraq, and Iran. So that Middle Eastern part of the world is where those would represent. So this beast is coming out, and you see that... These things represent the Middle East. So you start to wonder, you know, okay, so who is this beast and who does he represent? And as I go through tonight, I, I, you know, this is one man's opinion as he looks at the word and as he is trying to translate the word. So I want you to understand that, you know, when you're teaching Revelation, there are a lot of things that I might bring out, and then I, hopefully I'll tell you what's my opinion about some things, okay? So you'll know what my opinion is, but I'm going to show you what the Word says, and you can make your own judgments about a lot of things. But it appears that this beast is going to come from the Middle East, somewhere in the Middle East. He's going to be a man who comes to power pretty quickly. He's going to be a man that leads many nations. All these nations will, uh, will fall under him. Uh, he's the, he, he will be one of the greatest leaders who ever walked the earth. He will get many people to follow him quickly. Now, we have seen, we have seen how big, regardless of what side of the political aisle you're on, both sides 
We have seen how quickly people follow people and flock to them. Quickly. Almost to a religious standpoint. I, 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 you know, I'll, I'll drop some names, but, but you, you say something bad about President Obama or in the right circle and it's almost like you've said something against Jesus Christ. On the flip side of that, if we're honest, you say something bad about Trump in the right circles, you, you, you might get something violent happen to you too. We, we've, we've got these followings where these politicians come to, and, and some of it might be, might, might be legitimate in how we follow them. It's up to you how you decide to do that. I'm not knocking, supporting a certain leader if they're doing what is right, okay? I'm not knocking any of that at all, but I think we need to be careful how we put all our trust and faith in any politician. Okay. We need to be careful how we blame all the world's woes on one politician. Our God is in control. Because when we start doing that, it's like we're putting our faith in politics and we're putting our faith in government. I don't need government. All I need is Jesus. All I need is God to take care of me. Now, are there some things I wish they would do differently? Absolutely. Are there some things I think we need to speak out against? Absolutely. But we cannot put our faith and trust in that. But we have seen what happens when people do, and we see how quickly people can do that. In the last few years, we have, we have seen that. And you can just imagine now how when the Antichrist comes to power, and this is a man who brought peace to the world the first three and a half years, in the midst of all this turmoil, as much peace as you can, he's crying out for peace, and he's trying to bring things together, and he's blaming, blaming everything that's happening on this God that keeps bringing wrath, and these two witnesses that keep calling things down, and he's fighting against them, and finally these witnesses have gone away, and now here he is to stand, and now he starts to change his tune about a lot of things. So that's what we start to see here at this part of Revelation. We're starting to see this transition. We, we A lot of people have looked at this and seen Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece and Roman and Rome and the symbolisms here, and I could go through those leaders, Alexander the Great and Augustus and Nero, and how all these leaders are kind of combined into this one man, and, it, and the symbolism here is this one man. I just don't feel like I need to exhaust that tonight. I have a lot of notes here, but I'm just going to leave that alone. But you see the symbolism of this creature. Now let me tell you, we're living in a world today where we're starting to see the signs, or we have seen the signs for a little while, we're starting to see like every day something else is happening that's pointing to the end or the fact that Jesus could come back soon. They are blatantly, as we were talking about the New World Order earlier, they are blatantly doing things in front of our face and telling us what they're going to do and nobody's, it seems like, nobody's paying attention. Nobody cares, it seems. When I say nobody, I mean the majority of people in the world, they don't care. They don't care. Just in November, right outside of the UN headquarters in New York, uh, they, they, they put a statue that, that looks like this. And the beast, which I saw, was like unto a leopard, and his feet were at the feet of the bear, and his mouth is the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him power in his seat and great authority. This is the beast, the statue that they put outside of the UN headquarters. They called it the Guardian for International Peace and Security. Now they took it down December 20th. They said it was only a temporary thing. I, it might have been, doesn't look like a temporary thing to me. Looks like it looked like, okay, well maybe we're being a little too obvious with this thing. Maybe we should I, I don't see how this could be an accident. It could be. But I don't see how it could be. To me, they're just throwing it right in front of our face and said, look, we're bringing you to the end and we know it. And we don't care. Verse 3 tells us that 
He would be, this is another picture of that from the side you can see there. But verse 3 tells us he would be wounded to death. He's going to be wounded and killed. Now this is strategic. This is Satan allowing him to be killed in this moment. He's going to be killed. Somebody's going to, he's going to be wounded. He's going to die. And then he's going to be resurrected back to life. Many believe, many including me, believe that this is when Satan himself will actually enter him. Where he's no longer being controlled by Satan from the outside. He is being controlled from the inside. And he becomes Satan incarnate. Satan will take complete control of him in this moment. And then... Because he was a man who was dead and now he has been resurrected back to life, it will cause people to follow him even more at this moment. So then he will continue to be getting a following. And then verse 4 said, And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. Who's the dragon? Satan. Satan's the dragon. Satan gives power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, three and a half years. So the second half of the tribulation. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds, and tongues, and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the lame slain, slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. I think it's interesting that verse 9 would be there, He's, he, he's pausing to say, look, take in what I just said. This man is going to come. He's going to take. He's going to have great power. He's going to come. And he's going to control all the world. All the nations will worship him. The whole world, except for those who have received Christ, will worship this man. You talk about filling out numbers. When the whole world is worshiping one man, and you have decided that you're going to serve Christ in the middle of this tribulation, how lonely that must feel unless you're supported by other witnesses around you that are supporting you in that moment. But you, you, you this has got to be a terrible moment. A lot of times we think about all the bad things that are happening. We don't think about these saints who are going to be there because they have received Christ after the rapture. This has got to be a struggle for them. Now you can say, well, they, they should have accepted Christ beforehand, but they still are people who have accepted Christ. It's got to be a struggle for them in some senses, but in other senses it's got to be a glory to them because everything that's happening around them that is torturing the people around them is not happening to them because they've got the seal of God on the forehead. Because nothing is touching them in this moment. Daniel chapter 7 verse 25, And he shall speak great words against the most high. And they shall, and he shall wear out the saints of the most high. And think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. Again, that's three and a half years. It says he'll wear out the saints. Now I've talked about that before on Sundays, but we see that happening today, where it seems that he's wearing that this Antichrist spirit is trying to wear out the church, is trying to wear out the saints. But we're, going to, we're finding that those who really want to serve God and those who are strong in the Lord is really making us stronger because of what's going on in this world because it's making us plant our feet in the ground and say, I will not be moved. I'm going to serve God regardless of what everybody else does. 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 says, Who opposed and exalted, still talking about Antichrist, who oppose him and exalt himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So he tells us there that this Antichrist is going to go into the temple. We talked about the temple being rebuilt in Jerusalem. 
he's going to go into the temple, and he's actually going to sit on the throne and, and call himself God. Gives us the impression that he's actually going to sit on the Ark of the Covenant. Many believe the Ark of the Covenant, and we can't find it. Nobody knows where it well. Most people don't know where it's at. It's believed that some know where it's at, but they don't want to reveal it. I've heard a lot of different theories about where it's at. There's a little place in, I believe it's Ethiopia, um, that they have a little house that's hit that, that they will not let anybody near it. It's guarded day and night. And some people believe that the Ark of the Covenant is there. Some people think it's going to be found somewhere else, and it's dug somewhere else, that some of the Jewish people know where it's at and they'll find it. I believe in those last times they're gonna they're gonna somebody's gonna reveal where it's at, or even God's just gonna reveal where it's at. because um, you can't have the temple without the ark. Um, but I believe I believe one day they're gonna find that and that this is where he's gonna go in and desecrate the temple by being worshipped himself and set himself up as God. Revelation thirteen ten says, Be patient, Satan is work. Satan is at work, but he will receive the punishment for his work. He will be destroyed for his evil works. So John tells us all this and says, if any man have an ear, let him hear. And then he says, be patient. Satan is at work, but he will receive the punishment for his work. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patient and the faith of the saints. Satan is going to be destroyed. Satan is going to be destroyed. So he gives us this encouragement. He gives us this encouragement that he that God, even through all of this, while we're reading this, and while and we could be discouraged by the things that we see here, he says, be, be encouraged. This is the patience and the faith of the saints. That he that killed by the sword is going to die by the sword. Satan's going to come and he's going to try to destroy the people of God, but God's going to get the last laugh. God's going to get the victory. Revelation, and then in verse 11 it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. And causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he goeth great, and he doeth great wonders, so he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be healed. So now we have another beast. Later on in Scripture, it, it, it identifies this beast as the false prophet. It says he has two horns. Many people believe that the horns could represent the fact that he'll be both religious and political. That he'll 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 be reigning with both with both things. That he'll help the Antichrist by by being a political man, but he'll also help the Antichrist by being a religious guy that will cause people to want to worship the Antichrist. It says he spoke like a dragon. Now he, he appears as a lamb with two horns, but but he speaks like a dragon with power from his mouth. To cause people to want to believe what he says. So his appearance is going to be like a sheep. But he's a wolf in sheep clothing. As Matthew 7, 15 said, told uh, Jesus. Uh, I'm way behind on As Jesus told us that we should wait. And we should look. And watch out for these sheep. For these wolves in sheep clothing. This is the trinity of Satan. God has his trinity as we know and Satan has his in these last days. You'll see Satan continues to mock and counterfeit the things of God. We have 
in the Holy Trinity you have God the Father, and then you have in this evil Trinity Satan, which was represented by the dragon here in Revelation. Jesus is the Son of God. The Antichrist is essentially the Son of Satan. He is Satan incarnate on earth as Satan enters his body. Then we have the Holy Spirit of God who points us to Christ, who points us to worship of Christ. But now Satan has the false prophet who, is, who points them, the people of the world there, to the worship of the Antichrist. So he forms his own three-person trinity there to mock the things that God has done and try to do it his own way. But it will fail. In verses 12 through 15, we, we see that he, he told us he's going to, it tells us that he's going to do great wonders. He's going to perform miracles that will draw attention to the Antichrist. He's going to do things that are going to draw attention to, pe to for people to look for the Antichrist and look to the Antichrist and begin to worship the Antichrist. Satan understood that that's what drew a lot of people to Jesus was the miracles that he performed. So now he has someone there that's going to be performing miracles to draw people's attention towards his, his man of the hour, the Antichrist. They used fire to imitate the work of the witnesses in God himself. Then he has an image created. It says it's a huge image. He tells them that it says that they should make an image to the beast. And they make this image. And now they begin to worship it. It says that he'll even begin to give it lifelike characteristics. To make it even look alive. This Greek word here for give life. It means to give the impression of life. That it was actually an image that was made by man. That appears to be alive. Now we've spent a lot of time. At least growing up. I used to think that this had to be a statue of some sort. And be a huge statue that make it look alive. But I'm not, I'm not as convinced of that anymore. With the new technology that comes out, we always base things when we look at Revelation based on what we know right now. Right? And we'll do that tonight. And if the Lord tarries 20 years from now, we'll teach Revelation and we'll have new things to talk about that it could be in the last days. I don't know if he's going to tarry that long. I don't tend to believe he will. But I, I, what I do know is that it changes over time what our impression is of the word as we look at the symbolism in this word. He says it's going to be an image and all we knew it could be was some kind of statue or something that he could make. But we know that there's other ways that people do things today that makes people appear that they're there but they're not really there. All right, I'm going to show you an example of that in this video. You will find the same America of unlimited hope and opportunity that has been left to us by our parents. You know, I know you're ready for great opportunity. It's time for the train to move on. Well, I'm proud of Rancho Del Cielo, a 350-acre ranch overlooking the Pacific Ocean. It truly is. America, the beautiful. This is that Reagan's ladder. So much history. He's Look at the movement of his arms, his legs. By illustrious predecessors. So much so, in fact, that out of respect for this office and the events which have transpired in it, I almost never removed my suit coat. Now, I'm not telling you that's what it's going to be, but I can see where this image could be holograms. That's what that was. It was just a hologram. But it, it looks so lifelike in that moment. And so you can see where the false prophet would have it set up where these holograms could be throughout the world. So you wouldn't have to travel to see the Antichrist. You could worship him wherever he's at because essentially he could be everywhere. So it wouldn't have to even be one image. It could be a lot of images. It could be that one image, but it could be projected in a lot of different places. 
Now, I'm not saying that's what will happen. I'm just telling you that's a possibility of what will happen is people worship the Antichrist throughout the world as if he is right there in front of them and because they worship this image that is created for them. Image in the Greek there, according to Strong, means likeness, to be like. In the, in the Helps Word Studies, they say that word actually could be mean, could mean a mirror-like representation. And they actually say these words like a high-definition projection. So as we, as we move forward, right, we, we would like to stick with the commentaries of old that told us, and they did the best they could at that time, but now that we know new technology, now we see that we can compare that to things of today and say, hey, this is what it could be. But we do know this, regardless of what it is, the Bible tells us those who do not worship the beast will be killed. Those who do not worship him will die. Many believe that this is what Jesus was referring to in Matthew 24, when he said, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, that's the desecration of the temple, Spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let him which, it, which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation. Such as was not seen since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So you see there, these words from Jesus sound a whole lot like what is happening here in Revelation. How will they know who are worshipers of the beast? Verse 16 makes it clear how they'll know. And he calls them all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or in the foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that have understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six. Three score would be, there's 20 for every score. Three score would be 60. So it would be 666. There have been a lot of talk about, a lot of people say it's three sixes, or is 666. That could mean different things. There's been a lot of people trying to figure out where that number comes from what that number represents. I'm going to give you some theory, a couple of theories tonight. Um, there are some who correlate that those three numbers. There's, there's been talks about barcodes. We've talked a little bit about this already. There's been, there's been um, uh, I've, seen, I've seen people talk about um, how a lot of things that we symbolism we see today has these numbers hidden in them somehow. I've, I've even heard theories about the monster drink can and how every one of those little symbols that in the M, those three, is actually a Hebrew six. And it looks like an M on the can, but it's really three Hebrew sixes. I don't know if that's true. Um, but I, I, can, I can give you more information about that later if you're interested in that. There's a lot of other things about that that would correlate with that. I know it, it grabs people wrong when you start talking about those things. I think sometimes you'd be better off not knowing everything that's around you because it, it, would, it would make you too alarmed. Um, but there are a lot of things around us that, that a lot of people point to symbolism of that. I think sometimes people stretch those things. I'm not saying I believe that about, I'll let you decide about, about some of those products and things. But I, I, I'm just giving you some things that people say, right? Um, but they will be identified, they'll identify the worshipers by their mark. Now somehow they're going to have a mark in their forehead and in their hand, their right hand. Now, this is the, the alarming thing. We talked about the chip one time before and how they're putting chips in people's hands so that they can buy and sell even now. There's places where they can do that even right now as we speak. Um, 
and, and they keep pushing these chips now. These chips are big now. And, and, and there's there's a viral video going around now of the Pfizer CEO um, who's, who in 2018 was discussing a chip to put in a pill. So if you take the pill, they can track, your doctor can track whether you're taking your medicine or not. And then he, he said this phrase, imagine the implications, compliance. He used that word. He that has an ear, let him hear. Uh, we we got to be listening to what people are saying around us. They're telling us what they're doing if we're listening to their words, if we're listening to what they're doing. He said that, that he basically said this is how we get people to comply with what we want. Now he's using the example of doctors making sure their mental patients take their medicine. But you know if the government can get their hands on that, which they already are, because, well, Depends on what you believe about Pfizer, but there's a lot of stuff that you could go back and look at Pfizer and see how they're being controlled by government agencies and things like that. We have now, while everybody's like, Elon Musk, he's buying Twitter, this is great, Elon Musk is buying Twitter. Now, I don't have any personal opinions about the man myself, I don't know enough about him to have personal opinions, but I do know this, while everybody's worried about Elon Musk buying Twitter, Elon Musk is pouring billions of dollars into Neuralink which will take this chip and put it uh, up against your brain and send messages up against your brain and it'll work, he says in his own words, it'll work like a smartwatch. And he's hiring people that work with smartwatches to work with his company so that you can send messages and get, get messages back and forth. Now, they're selling this thing by saying that uh, it's gonna heal certain diseases including Parkinson's and, other diseases that that your brain might affect those things he, he, he's selling that with that but they're going to start trial bases it says as early as the end of this year um on people so you can imagine like we've got okay you got buying stuff with your hand now the stuff in your head i'm not saying the mark is going to be is going to necessarily be the chip but you can see how we're leading to those end times where you can be controlled by those things if you can get messages in, they can probably find ways to transmit messages out. And who in the world wants free range for anybody to send messages in? Now, I like to be able to turn my um, phone off every now and then. I hardly ever do. But sometimes we like to put it on silent every now and then. But who wants messages being sent in? Again, if the government gets a hold of that, what could they do with that? So if you have an antichrist that's in control of all these things, what could they do with that? Can I just say this? With it, 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 it is kind of it, 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 it is kind of interesting if you think about it that a lot of these things that are happening can only happen if you have billions of dollars to do it, and there's only a handful of people in the world that can do that. So there's only a handful of people that can control the whole world if they're allowed to. And so this is interesting so we can see how one person could control the world. And you could probably name those four or five people right now thinking about the names you've heard in the news recently. Are you going to tell them about the, the application? What application? The, um, where did you get the social security number the college app? Oh, no, I forgot about that. No, I forgot about that. There's actually, there's actually, you, there's a place where you can fill out, where you fill out federal aid. I saw this online, and you know, you see stuff on social media, you're like, you know, right? Y'all, y'all just post anything. So I went and searched it up for myself. And if you file for federal aid, I guess, oh, for, FAFSA. for FAFSA, for college aid, if you don't know your social security number, they literally tell you that if you don't have a social security or you don't know your social security number, just put 666 in the line. I kid you not. Yeah. They could have used any number in the world. They could have said zero, 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 but they said use 666 in the line. Right in front of our faces, they're telling us. They're telling us what they're doing. They didn't mm -hmm. just say on the blank, like that where it says you're so scared. Or even set it down in the directions, too. On mm -hmm. down on like page nine or something. They even set it in the directions specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is the 
where the world's going. I remember being in middle school and just having middle schoolers, and for whatever reason, we had a locker number that was 666. And I remember a young man who came to me and said, and said, Mr. Bradshaw, and this was a kid that, you know, he wasn't always on the up and up, but he knew enough to know. He came to me and said, Mr. Bradshaw, they gave me this number, and I don't want it. I said, well, I don't want you to have it. That, that locker will be empty now. I'll get you another number. Because people, people understand the significance of that number, but it's like people aren't observant to what's going on around them. Six is the number of man. So it makes sense that this would be the number of the Antichrist. Those who do not take the mark will not eat, they will not drink, and they will be killed if they will not serve the beast. Now, this is another interesting thing about this. Now, I did some research, and I found that this is exactly the truth. So you, you can argue, you can say, oh, man, but just go look it up for yourself. Please, anything I say, just go look it up for yourself and see for yourself. But I, 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 this is, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you this. The phrase, in the name of Allah, is up to the top right here. Is the top phrase you see right here. In Greek, that's Arabic. In Greek, the number 666 looks like this. There's a lot of similarity in those two things. You can argue they're not exactly the same. Now, you do have to tilt the name of Allah a little bit to get it like this, but there's no changing of the letters. This looks almost identical to each other uh, when you look at these two things. Now, this is another interesting thing about this is that Islamic warriors, they wear that phrase on their headband and on their right arm. So it's not too much of a stretch for you to say, hey, guys, instead of just wearing a band, let's put it on your forehead. Let's put it on your hand. Not too much of a stretch to say that this Antichrist is coming out of the Middle East. Not too much of a stretch, I don't believe, to say that the biggest religion in the world today is Islam. And that they could very, this could very easily be a time where people say, hey, I'm game. Let's, let's be Islamic now. Let's follow this one world religion, but being controlled by Islamic people or by an Islamic antichrist. One who portrays to be for all religions, but really is for Allah, which ultimately is Satan. I know that could get me in trouble in a lot of circles, but I, I, anything that's not Christ is controlled by Satan. Any religion. Imitating, so he's imitating what God did by marking the 144,000, and now he's marking his people. Seven churches, so, so his number was six, but we see the seven keep popping up in Revelation. So we assume the seven is the number that, G, that God chooses to use. Seven has always been what we call the lucky number anyway, but it's the blessed number. It's, 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 it, it represents holiness. The seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets. Later in Revelation, we'll see the seven-headed Lamb of God, the seven, and we start talking about the seven spirits of God. God's people will sing a sevenfold doxology. So Satan is mimicking what Jesus is doing or what in Revelation. He's mimicking what God is doing, but he can't, he can't quite do it with the same power. He never will be able to. Revelation 14 is like a break to tell us, to give us encouragement about things that are going to happen. And we're, we're going to go through Revelation 14 pretty quickly. And I look low, because we're going to talk about a lot of these things later on in Revelation and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as a voice of many waters, and as a voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts. And the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty-four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, 
for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. God's still going to protect them these last three and a half years. He's just showing what's going to happen afterwards. So he's saying, look, if you're reading this and you're getting really worried, just know these 144,000 are going to be okay. God's people are going to be okay. So he stops to encourage us. He keeps doing that throughout Revelation. He stops to encourage us and say, look, it's going to be all right. God's got his people. The last couple of chapters could be rather depressing and discouraging, but God interrupts it with some encouragement. You ever been watching a movie and your kids start to get a little nervous about, about what's happening in the movie or get a little scared or upset? And sometimes even a little cartoon and they get a little nervous and and then, but you've seen it already. You know how it is. Or at least you know that they're not going to end like this. It's got to be something better than this. So you have to tell them, it's going to be okay. It all, turn, it all turns out in the end. This is what God is doing here. He's tell, telling his children, look, don't fret, don't worry. It's going to be all right in the end. If ever we need to hear a word like that, it's in today's time. God is telling his church, look, don't get worried about the things around you. Don't get overly concerned about the things around you. Yes, I want you to fight against evil while we're here. Yes, I want you to fight the good fight. I want you to, to be mindful and watch and pray as you, and, and, then, and then ever more serve me even more as we see the day approaching. Continue to continue to join together, but while you're doing that, no, it's going to be all right. The end's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. We continue to see this lamb that was slain worshipped throughout this time because he's going to get his worship. In the end, he's going to be victorious. Psalm chapter 2 tells us of, 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 of a lot of what goes on um, in Revelations here, some people say it's even prophetic when it says the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointing, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Zion there. Would, would be Jerusalem today. That's where Zion is in Jerusalem, the mountain in Jerusalem. That's, we, Jerusalem is set upon that mount of Zion. Um, I'm going to skip to Isaiah chapter 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. Verse 4 says, He shall... Judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people and shall, shall beat their sword to the plowshares and their spears and their pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. He's telling us there, it's going to end out okay. We're, we're going to be all right. In the end, everything's going to be all right. People are going to put away their weapons and there's going to be peace forevermore. We're going to live together and reign with him forevermore. All 144,000 are still there after the tribulation. They're going to be preserved by God. There's pure worship in heaven. They're singing a new song. No one can sing the song that they've sung. No one has seen what they have seen, and no one has gone through what they have gone through, and they begin to sing a new song. It says that, that no man could learn that song but the 144,000. <clears throat> they lived a life of purity. They followed Jesus in all that they did. 2 Corinthians tells us about that life of purity when he says, For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. These are spiritual virgins. They've given themselves to true devotion to God. There's no guile, and there's no, they spoke truth. He continues in verse 6 to say, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them to dwell on the earth, uh, that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue of people saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. So He proclaimed that we should worship the One who created it all. 
the creation that God had created, we should worship, look around and see that He's in control of it all and we should worship Him. If God could create this universe and God could create this earth and God could put all this together and God could make our bodies work the way they do, I mean, just your eyeball working the way it does is fascinating. It's a miracle within itself. And if God can do that, He can take care of His people. And when we look at creation, we look at this universe, we ought to see a God who's in control. That itself ought to give us confidence. In verse 8, he says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of a fornication. We look around this world today, and we see everything that's going on, and it seems overwhelming at times. It seems pretty stupid at times when we look at what people believe and it's the stuff that comes out of their mouth. You can't get people to define what a woman is. You can't get people to say that only women can have babies. You can't get, you can't get people to say that they're, they're a boy or a girl. I mean, some of the stuff that we're hearing today, it's like, are we really, are we living, are we living in, in another era? Are we living in the twilight zone? What's going on? What's going happening around the world? And we see all these things. But God reminds us that one day that world system is going to fall. One day, everything they've done is going to crash. And God's reminding us here that be encouraged. The Creator is still in control. Be encouraged. He's going to take care of His people. And be encouraged. He's going to take care of Babylon too. He's going to take care of this world system. And the third angel, He's literally going to take down the city. We'll see that a little later on in Revelation. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive the mark of his forehead on his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in the image, and whosoever receive the mark of his name. God's given a warning there and saying, look, if you want to serve the devil, just know that you're going to pay Comp, you're going to have, you're going to, you're going to make the choice to be tormented forever and ever. God doesn't wish that any man should perish, but people make that choice by rejecting Him, and, and by rejecting Him, they're receiving the evil of this world and they're receiving the punishment that they'll take. Jesus spoke more about hell than any other New Testament writer, and He spoke more about hell than He did heaven, because He wanted to warn people of what is to come. He wanted to let people know that this thing is real because, because he knew there would be a time where people would want to emphasize heaven and heaven and heaven but not warn people of hell. And he said, I, I want people to know that this is important that you tell them that there is a judgment to come. And then he ends verse 14. And that's where we'll end tonight. I mean, chapter 14 with verse 12 here through 20. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a gold crown, and his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap. For the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, and, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress wine press was trodden without the city. And the blood came out of the winepress, even to the horse's bridle, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. That's a mile wide, 160 to 200 miles long. Scripture tells us the blood will be four feet high to the horse's bridle. We know by doing the math that if, if we have billions of people now, I believe it's eight or nine billion people, but at the least there'll be, at the most, there'll be two billion people 
that will be here in that moment. About 10% of those people would be 200 million soldiers that we had talked about earlier and that we'll see again at the Battle of Armageddon. This is what he's talking about. We're going to talk more detail about the Battle of Armageddon later. So I'm not skipping over that because they're just giving a precursor to what's going to happen later in Revelation. We're going to talk more detail about that later. But when you think about the horrendous act that's going to happen there to these people because they wouldn't serve God. But God is letting his people know in this chapter of encouragement that no matter what they do to you, I've got it. It's going to be all right. Nothing they have done has not been seen. Those who persecute here, us here on earth, the enemy, the spiritual demons and all of them that, that torture us at times or might, or might come against us and put thoughts in our minds and, and we seem, we seem uh, flustered at times and, 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 and have come against your family members, they're going to have their day too. God's going to God's going to ultimately protect his people. God is still, if you don't learn anything else, these three things, God's going to protect his people. God is always in control. Yeah. And God, there is judgment to come for those who come against God's people. The famous song, we, 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 know the, we know the verse, my eyes have seen the coming of the glory of the Lord. But the next verse says, my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling, the next line, he is trampling out the vineyard where the grapes of wrath are stored. He was talking about what we just read. He had loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Lies, lies, and more lies are being told today. Seems like some people, when you see them, people on TV, politicians, every time they open their mouth, there's another lie coming out. Lies upon lies upon lies. But those lies are going to die one day. But the truth will always march. The way, the truth, and the life will be here forever. And we're going to worship him forever. The truth will always Anything you want to add to my before Father, thank you for your word tonight. Lord, thank you, Father, that you're in control, that you're still on the throne. Lord, we thank you, Father, that, that we can put our trust completely in you, Lord, and that if you have if you have formed this world and everything in it, Lord, that we can trust that you're gonna that you have us in your hands. And that everything's going to be all right. So, Lord, we're just going to put our faith and trust in you. And we know how this story ends. We know how everything ends. And it ends with you being victorious. And, Lord, if you're victorious, then your people are victorious too. And, Lord, we thank you, Father, for that. We thank you that we can trust in you. We thank you for your mercy, Lord. We don't deserve to be in your kingdom. But through your blood, we are. And, Lord, we thank you, Father. We thank you for all that you're going to do. Lord, we thank you, Father, that you always have our back and that vengeance is yours. We ask, Father, that you continue to encourage your people. Remind us of this word, Lord. In days to come when we're discouraged by the things of this world, remind us of this word again. And, Lord, we'll give you praise and glory for it. Lord, be with each one here tonight. May your protective hand be upon them as they travel home. But, Lord, put a hedge of protection around them and the rest of our church family, Lord. Lord, that these sicknesses will not continue to, uh, to plague them, that we can come back on Sunday, Lord, and enjoy our time together, Lord, that everyone will be here. And we thank you for that. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.